we hear who has public comment for us that's not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I need to see who's online. Is there any online? Seeing none online either. Uh, we'll get to our first agenda item. Bear with me. This is PL 2023-0090, uh, Steamboat Social Club. Uh, is the applicant here for a presentation? Come on down. Hi, I'm Tim Hickory, Michael Britton. And um, yeah, we are the co-owners of Steamboat Social Club. Thank you for having us tonight. We're excited to be here and talk to you. We just wanted to introduce ourselves, um, give you just a brief overview of the business and be available for any questions that you might have. Um, so Steamboat Social Club, we're located at 1103 Lincoln, where the old Steamboat Whiskey Company was located. And the concept of our business is a um, co-working space, community-centric, um, geared towards local business owners, um, remote workers, and small businesses within the county um, to have a spot that they can come collaborate and work out of. Um, and then this um, other part of the business is a um, private event space, so where community members can rent our facility to, to host their own private events at. Um, we've been in communication with the planning department and the building department um, about how to implement the business in town. And um, most of what we've worked with them on is in your submittal packets, but um, happy to answer any questions you have and just wanted to give you a friendly face to put towards the business. All right, great, thank you very much. Yeah. The staff have a presentation as well. Yeah. Uh, so as um, they mentioned, this is will be for two conditional uses at 1103 Lincoln Avenue. It sits on the corner of Lincoln and 11th Street, formerly the uh, whiskey company, for those of you that are familiar and trying to place it. Um, the building itself, there are leasing tenant spaces that face to Lincoln Avenue, as well as the back portion that faces, there's an entrance to 11th Street. The rafting company itself along 11th Street fits in there. That's not part of this application. That's a separate, you know, leased space. And their, their space kind of U-shapes around that, if that makes any sense. The two commercial use, or two conditional uses, rather, in commercial Old Town for us that we'll be looking at today are office. Uh, the reason being the use standard for office in commercial Old Town is to not be in the pedestrian active building frontage. So they are, you know, building all the way out to the pedestrian active area where the sidewalk goes and the street goes along 11th. So we review as conditional use. Uh, secondly, the indoor event venue, which was uh, recently adopted by ordinance uh, 2894, uh, January of this year, all of our event venues are considered conditional uses for review uh, because they all operate so uniquely. Um, we want to assess them and make sure that they are appropriate in the place that they're being positioned. The first one I'll address is a conditional use for office. Um, we don't have any specific references in uh, to office use or commercial old town within our community plan or other adopted plans. In terms of um, the intended uh, purpose for the district of commercial Old Town, we find that it's geared toward that emphasizing active commercial uses on the pedestrian level, hence the use standard of making sure that that pedestrian active area is, you know, typically or not included in office space. We don't typically find that office activates the pedestrian active building frontage. In this case, staff found um, that this office use was uh, quite a bit different than what we believe the um, CDC definition of an office would consider, in part because this office space is open to the public and allows those users to come and go more like a typical sort of retail establishment or other uses that would be allowed in this zone district. Um, also with the types of members that 
potentially are using it throughout flexible work hours, it wouldn't have that same sort of fixed ratio of arrival at nine, departure at five, sort of, you know, rush hour flows and dead time in between that people might be more transient in and out, moving to meetings using, uh, again, a flexible space, thinking about how it, it caters to those flexible office users. Uh, so we did find that it was consistent with the Old Town Zone District emphasis toward that pedestrian activity. Um, in terms of negative impacts, staff did not find that um, office use would generate any offsite detrimental impacts to surrounding buildings and that it does comply uh, with all other parts of the CDC. The second conditional use is the conditional use as an event venue. Uh, again, there's nothing in specific reference to event venues in our Old Town Commercial District. Uh, and we did find it you know, consistent otherwise with the code. The general purpose of commercial Old Town, as we sort of stated there in that last conditional use, is this mixed use activated streetscape um, as a new use that we haven't really addressed very well um, in Ordinance 2894. Uh, staff believe that this proposed indoor event venue would add diversity uh, to this mixed use and certainly help activate the streetscape. Uh, it's our belief that if a business is coming in, potentially that's because there's a great need for it. And it's, you know, of the applicant's best interest to activate and use this space and book it as much as possible, contributing to this pedestrian activity. Um, the negative impacts potentially caused by this and are probably um, most acute to review on a event venue use certainly are you know some of the noise and the foot traffic um, certain that we know that noise levels are enforced by the police and through municipal code so that's a piece of it um, then there are general considerations about what levels of, of nuisance might be at play or adjacent uses it does sit on the corner um, the buildings actually barely attached to the adjacent building. Um, most likely this would operate outside of normal business hours. So next to normal businesses, you know, it's not going to generate necessarily the, you know, noise or negative impacts. Uh, we actually found it to be a fairly suitable location for an event venue in downtown. All those things considered, there's no housing above, there's no housing adjacent to it or anything like that. Uh, just like the first conditional use, um, it does fit within all other applicable code requirements in the CDC. Uh, ultimately, staff does recommend uh, approval for condi both conditional uses uh, for the Steamboat Social Club project code PL2023-0090. Great. Thank you very much. Questions from commissioners? Yeah, um, looking at your floor plan here, where exactly would the venue space be located in here? That would be the Lincoln facing side. Okay, so you just clear out all the tables and couches and stuff and have so are, like yeah. a small concert kind of thing going? Yeah, those are kind of um, there if people want to use them for like a more relaxed event. More of like a lounge. Um, and if they want to do more of like a dinner style or something like that, then we can clear those out. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Yeah. I'll go for staff. Uh, do we have any requirements for parking for an event venue? Yeah. So when we develop the and adopted the event venue parking standards in downtown, we made them match the existing parking standards of businesses. So we have the sort of convenience of rollover from the previous one and so there, while there are standards, um, they're meeting the standards because they were assumed to be met previously. Are there, well, and, and those parking standards are based on square footage? Um, in this case, uh, I believe, yes, it is square footage for all of the downtown. I'll pull that up real quick. So when you say you made it the same as 
every other CO use? Is that what you're saying? No matter. Well, for a majority of our CO uses, yes, from retail to food establishments. That's correct. Uh, retail and restaurants, we try to, and office as well, coordinate so that all of those parking standards are the same, recognizing that those um, spaces, the uses um, change over time in our spaces downtown. And that's one per 300 square feet. Okay, thank you. And I know you've, uh, we've applied this before, right, Jeremy? On other projects uh, where you just kind of, what's the net difference when you change a use on an existing building? Yeah, correct. That, that being said, is there any provided parking for this property? I don't believe that there is. The applicant could answer to that. Uh, no, there is not. Right. Yep. And I want to all stand corrected. It's one per 900 square feet. I apologize in commercial old town. Okay. Additional questions? <clears throat> no, hearing none. Is there any public comment for this agenda item? Nope. Hearing none of that either. Uh, unless you've got any final follow up to share. I think we're good. Appreciate oh, your time. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. From Jeremy. Nothing else from staff. No other questions from us. I'll close the public portion. Come to commissioners for discussion and motion. I'm I'm not concerned about the parking. It was a kind of a restaurant and distillery previously. So I would assume the same parking or less would be probable here. So I'm I'm less concerned about that. And I I would motion to approve. EL 2023-0090. Okay, we'll second the motion. Motion and a second. Any other discussion? And I would say with the event, I have concerns about it, but they're meeting the code. It's some, whether it's a loophole or whatever, and downtown, I understand all that, but the number of people that you could fit in an event square, you know, square footage is different than a restaurant and different, you know, different than retail. <clears throat> I mean, you could, I don't know what the fire code is, but you could, and it's, something that needs to be addressed, but not necessarily at this meeting. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That's how I'm feeling too. It, it meets the code similarly with the, the net change on parking, even though there would not be meeting the parking standard if it was new construction, a little bit frustrating. I think they're meeting the code just fine. Noise ordinances take care of, of any nuisance problems. So I don't see any problems either. I would also agree with, uh... Jeremy's statement about the uh, by use office right, you know, uh, drop in. I think not only that, not only that people are coming and going at different hours, you could also either exponentially have more people utilizing that space than a fixed office, mm -hmm. which helps to some degree the uh, vitality issue for mm -hmm. ground floor use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other discussion? Yeah, I've um, been in the space both as it is currently. Um, as a social club and prior as the whiskey bar, you know, the whiskey bar didn't have a lot of uh, earlier daytime use. And this just kind of brings a new vibrancy to that street that um, is fairly quiet or could be quiet during the day. I think it's a, it's a nice, healthy environment and that I'm uh, in favor of it. Not hearing any other discussion, then I will uh, call for a vote. Yes. Oh, here tonight. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. Great. Pass unanimously. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Right. Appreciate you. it. Good luck. Forget we can't have too many people. <laughs> no, you can't. We have an empty spot. Uh, agenda item number two this evening is PL 2023-0088. This is a steamboat axe throwing company. See applicant here for a presentation. Hi guys, um, my name is Jerry Davis. Um, I'm representing the timber, and uh, I'd just like to introduce the four of us real quick. Um, like I said, I'm Jerry Davis. My wife Anna Davis is a partner, and then Craig Preston is on the Zoom meeting right now, and his wife Mandy Preston. Um, our property manager, I believe, is in the building, Sebastian. And we'll get started here. So 
Uh, the timber is seeking approval for from the city of Steamboat Springs for a conditional use approval for, to utilize a portion of the property located at 2851 Riverside Plaza for an axe throwing business. Uh, the timber has executed a lease to occupy unit 190 of Riverside Plaza. This space is currently a wide open space, approximately 100 feet long by 31 and a half feet wide, with no interior walls and a concrete floor. The space is, has some infrastructure already, such as lighting, uh, perimeter electrical outlets, and a unit heater. Uh, let's see, we, we plan to transform this space into an indoor axe throwing venue. An axe, throw, axe throwing is a unique, fun, safe, and fast growing entertainment experience that does, sorry, that offers multiple axe throwing games to adults and kids in a fun, safe atmosphere. The space is designed to put guests at ease and encourage socialization. We are very excited to bring this fun indoor activity to the Yampa Valley. Um, and if you guys can't tell, you think you guys all have the narrative that I'm, I'm kind of highlighting here. So um, we will have uh, customer service check-in desk near the front door, tables and seating, uh, a bar slash concession stand area, uh, ax throwing lanes, restrooms, and an office. It's, it's outlined in the narrative, but it's, it's kind of changed due to uh, the amount of bathrooms we need or uh, pursuant to the liquor license, we need certain things changed in there. So uh, we're kind of working on all that right now. But um, over time, we're going to add amenities such as uh, video games, darts, cornhole, uh, maybe a pool table in there. So uh, the space will be perfect to accommodate up to 10 families, couples, and or small groups in any given at any given time during normal operation. But also we are looking to do larger groups such as birthday parties, uh, corporate events, and uh, team building things, fundraising groups, and holiday parties. Um, initially, we plan to be open from 4 to 10 p.m. daily. And we're going to adjust these hours depending on use patterns as we identify them through the first year. Uh, the majority of use at our facility will be from online reservations through our website, uh, although we will accommodate walk-ins. Um, you know, if we got an open lane, we're not going to turn anybody away. So um, safety is, of course, going to be paramount. That's the biggest question I get asked when people talk to me about running this or starting this is, do people get hurt or... Uh, but so we'll go over some of the safety protocols here. There's a video on the website that you, you can watch before you even step foot in the building. And then customers will be mandated to sign a liability waiver um, that outlines the safety protocols prior to throwing. Uh, there will be an instructional and safety talk given to every group before they start throwing. And there will be rules posted at each lane. Uh, there'll be mats hanging all around the target. So if you miss the target, it will hit and fall instead of bouncing back. Um, and also rubber mats on the floor also, so it won't bounce off the floor. Um, let's see. Uh, so there's a safety line. If you guys saw the, the picture when you guys all came in, there's a red line in front of the throwing lanes. That'll be your throwing line. So only one person there at a time. And that'll, uh, that'll divide the, the room, I guess, from your throwing area to your common area. Um, uh, guests are greeted once they enter the timber and take to their appointed lane or lanes. Various similar businesses charge $35 to $45 uh, per guest for a one-hour time slot, and I think we're going to fall in there somewhere. Uh, that's a maximum of eight people per lane. Uh, so learning the basics of being accurate, uh, being an accurate safe axe thrower is fun itself. And the excitement of sticking your first axe and landing your first bullseye is amazing. And once they master the basics to keep folks coming back for more, uh, the timber has a wide variety of game options. Um, additionally, the timber offers parties and corporate events like we went through before. And guests love the option of renting multiple lanes for the entire family or larger groups to come in. So what I mean by uh, multiple game options is it's not just going to be a target on the wall. We're going to have projectors that the target will move and there's games on it, such as tic-tac-toe or candy crush. Um, there was a zombie game that they'll move around and you throw axes at them. And we're going to do axes, ninja stars, uh, throwing knives. And, and yeah, so um, 
we're going to have some music playing in the background. It's not going to be loud enough to be heard outside. Um, let's see. It'll have the similar effects as a, or impacts to the property. It'll be similar to a retail or general indoor use facility. Um, customers will park at the front of the property in the shared parking lot for the property. So I think, I think that's about all I got. So if you guys have any questions or I know, like I said, Craig is on the zoom meeting. If he has anything he wants to add. I don't think so. Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Okay. And when staff's ready. Sure. Uh, I'll be going through this on behalf of Kelly Douglas, senior planner who did the review of this, but certainly uh, any questions relating to code, we sh I should be able to answer for you. Um, you heard most of the background on the project itself. For those of you that need oriented a bit more, it's the Riverside Plaza there just um, east of the the bowling snowball plaza um, right there along 40. It's an existing building for reference in case that wasn't um, completely obvious. So there are no exterior renovations that are occurring to this project. It's all inside. It's about the conditional use itself. Uh, we classify ax throwing as amusement indoor. Of course, this is a conditional use in the CSO district why it's here before you. Relevant plans, the future land use map actually identifies this in the future. It is CS now, identifies it as community commercial. And our community commercial does emphasize of all things entertainment uses, which we feel this fits in quite neatly uh, with explicit support for that um, and the preferred direction coming out of the community area plan. You know, we do find that it, it does meet those adopted plans and is consistent with them. We also find it's consistent with the purpose of the zone district currently, uh, even being that the CS zone district is intended to provide areas for higher intensity community wide commercial uses. Um, amusement indoor is a commercial use uh, that we do find suitable with similar impacts to any of the other commercial uses that might be found in this area. In terms of negative impacts, um, the Staff does not anticipate having any impacts beyond those that might be other normal commercial uses if you think about and compare them. Obviously, we had some good explanations about noise volume and activities and foot traffic and the like. Uh, I know we talked about parking on the last conditional use to address that here. As a reminder, um, in our CES zone district, the parking recommendations are actually maximums, not minimums. So we're not looking for a minimum amount of parking here. We're also not dealing with any building expansion or changes to it. So the parking square footage isn't changing. The parking's not changing. We're actually would only be looking for a maximum of parking. So they're not planning to add parking. We're not necessarily reviewing against parking. Um, otherwise, everything is compatible with the remaining applicable requirements of the CDC and staff recommend approval of PL 20230088 steamboat axe throwing. All right, thanks very much. Questions from commissioners? Yeah, just uh, for clarification, the applicant indicated there might be changes upcoming uh, internal to the, the facility. And I'm assuming that our categorization of amusement indoor covers all of that regardless of what the changes are going to be yeah if it still fit within the amusement indoor category this conditional use as adopted would would cover that okay thank you so it's the same principle as say a bowling alley yeah yeah <clears throat> we have a we have a floor plan in our packet. And if that were to change, is that just handled administratively? If there are, you see, I'm, the applicant mentioned having to move bathrooms or add bathrooms. Is that something that's handled administratively? It doesn't have to be handled at all. Rebecca, do you want to answer that? If, mm -hmm. if they're changing, the use would remain the same, but if they're changing floor plans dramatically, would that affect our approval? Yeah, so is the is the floor plan, what? in the packet what's existing or what's proposed um so this was our our initial floor plan here and in the packet it's got um 
it's got the one bathroom, a one toilet, and um, we need four toilets, a men's and a women's bathroom, and then a handicap accessible bathroom in the middle. So um, in the floor plan in the top corner there where the bathrooms are, that's just going to turn and add more room for uh, water closets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, I think um, those changes we would handle through a building permit process. It wouldn't expand or increase the footprint of this use and it wouldn't change this use at all. So we would not um, find that it would have to come back through this process. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Another one for the applicant is, I mean, I know this is a relatively new sport. Is there a industry group and are there industry standards? Um, as, as far as the act throwing standards is really what I'm, I'm thinking about. Okay. Um, so yes. And it's, it's hard to, I'm trying to think of a good way to say it. So, so we just went to Frisco and did it, um, uh, about a couple months ago. And as soon as we walked in the door, you go in and there's, there's a list of all the rules for throwing and, um, the lady there that was running the place, she walks you to your lane and she teaches you how to throw the axes. And you, like I said, you have to sign a waiver to go in there and throw. And then, I mean, you watch a video. It's, I don't, I guess I don't really know how to answer that. Let's see if, if Craig's on, do you know how to answer that, Craig? You have to allow him. I don't think I do, but he's, I can he's add that there is quite a bit of, of, uh, I guess, process behind this. I mean, six years ago when I was still in Denver, I won a major competition in ax throwing with a buddy of mine. So, <laughs> well, so, um, it, it has grown since then. And there's been a lot uh, of change in the industry, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of process there. So initially we're gonna, we're gonna do all projectors like I mentioned before, instead of the, the planks with the target drawn on it. And um, there is a national league that's called Waddle, uh, W-A-T-L. And um, eventually we're going to have our lanes to accommodate them. So uh, when they come skiing in the, in the winter, they can come get their throws in for the week. And it's got to be all regulation. There's, there's rules and they have to have an official judge there to, to score them and, and so on. So we will most likely be following their safety regulations. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? On your floor plan, you have a uh, dashed area of mobile axe trailer size pending. So um, one of our other goals is to build a trailer, a mobile trailer that we will take to events such as art in the park or whittle the wood in Craig or Hayden days in Hayden. And, um, you know, we'll put two targets on it and, you know, we can just be mobile and bring some fun to events that are around the area. And that is cause this, there's a big roll up garage door right where that is. And that's just to store that. So, um, we don't have enough room at, any of our houses. So it would just be a great place to pull that in and it'd be out of everybody's way. Okay. And, and from a use standpoint, is that become a storage use? Is it, it, it's already been accounted for, or does it somehow become amusement outdoor and complicates things? How does that tie in? If they're not planning to do it there, I think it would just be accessory to the use itself. No, no different than having a small office space in Whatever business you're running, we don't look at it like office. It's just we understand that you're going to have an office in your coffee bean roasting company or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Seeing none, is there any public comments on this agenda item? Or any online? Hearing none there as well. Do you have any final follow up? No, just thank you guys for your time and. Oh, we hope we can get this done. Great. Any from Jeremy? Nothing else from staff. Then I'll close our public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I move to approve PL 2023-0088 as recommended by staff. Second.
We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? It fits in both. I think it fits both CS and CC. Uh, yeah, I don't. I see no planning impacts to be, that need to be addressed any more than they are. Any other discussion? Yeah, I've done this in Canada. It was pretty fun. I didn't get the rush of hitting a bullseye, but it was a fun activity. It was robust, full that night. Um, we kind of need fun activities to do. We have a few, um, but this will be a great ad. I agree. I think this is a unique thing for our town to have. Um, they are starting to pop up, but you just don't see a lot of this. Unless you're in a big city, maybe. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo you guys. I think it's uh, it's going to be a great use and a great location. I don't see any adverse impacts noise-wise or, or otherwise. So I think it should be great. Hearing none other, I'll uh, call for a vote. Yes. Yes. Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. All right. Thanks very much. Good luck. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Our agenda item number three this evening is PL 2023-0092. And I will recuse myself. And Lou will recuse himself. Thanks very much, Lou. I'm somebody to state why. No, oh, yeah, we've been stating Rebecca why. Can you give us for the record? Yeah. So we have reasoning. Which is for... one of the units in the subject property. Thank you, Rich. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lou. And when you're ready. Hello. Um, my name is Lacey Morrill. I am a design associate at Mountain Architecture Design Group. Um, just to start, we are here on behalf of Steamboat Lockers, LLC. Uh, Thomas O'Winter and Emily O'Winter, owners of Steamboat Lockers, are available um, on the Zoom call. So we are here for a conditional use request at Gondola Square, Unit C2, located at 2305 Mount Warner Circle. The conditional use is indoor self-service storage facility for lockers. And to give you guys context to the location, Unit C was previously Gondola General, um, a retail store next to Gnarly Charlie's Pizzeria. And on the other side, there's a candy shop, uh, Kegel Gulch Candy. Uh, Steamboat Lockers are tenants at Gondola Square, Unit C2. Gondola Square is an existing building at the Steamboat Base area located in the G2 or Gondola 2 zone. Unit C2 is located in the middle of the three levels at Gondola Square with access from both the Gondola Transit Center, public parking, and the plaza side of the building. We have been working with Steamboat Lockers on planning an interior renovation that will provide indoor self-service locker rentals. The proposed plan provides approximately 360 lockers, boot storage, a changing room, a lounge seating area facing the plaza side entrance, within a 3,745 square foot interior space. The lounge seating will help maintain an active storefront. It is important to highlight the duration of locker rentals. Locker rentals are annual. Locker renewal occurs at the end of the ski season and users will maintain locker possession over the summer and throughout the upcoming winter season. Users will be able to store hiking shoes during the summer, extra socks, sunscreen, bike helmets, hip packs, anything you need to recreate at the ski area during the summertime and fall and spring. Um, families will also have quick, quick access to storage for picnic items if they want to hang out by Burgess Creek at the beach. In the G2 zone, self-service storage lockers are conditional use with use standards. Our request is for a conditional use of Unit C2 as indoor self-service storage facility or ski or recreation locker rentals. That is a tongue twister. In the permitted use matrix, table 300-1, technically ski lockers are outlined, or any locker in, is outlined as industrial use classification. However, lockers provide a service. In G2 zone districts, individual storage units or lockers are permitted and shall be accessed from the interior of the building. For the CDC, the gondola zone districts are intended to be mixed use. This zone encourages areas for resort oriented, high intensity commercial, residential and lodging uses that are complementary to and supportive of the base area. 
The zone district allows for creative design flexibility and emphasizes pedestrian oriented interconnected development and dense public spaces surrounding the base area. Indoor locker storage supports the goals of the, zone, the gondola zone district. Storage, or sorry, locker storage offers amenities for the surrounding high density residential and lodging uses, as well as dispersed user, users throughout the local community who utilize public transit and parking to access the base area. Steamboat Lockers at Gondola Square complies with all applicable requirements of the CDC and is consistent with criteria for approval for conditional use. It complements the, the Zone District's Mountain Area Master Plan. The proposed lockers are supportive of winter and summer resort activities. This use will help provide infrastructure that encourages people to utilize and activate the base area longer um, after they have removed and stored their gear. Additionally, this use will help reinforce interconnection within the mountain resort community. Planning is in support of our of this use. Um, we also have floor plans um, in this presentation that's pulled up. Um, if you guys want to review specifically the layout or have additional questions for us. All right. Thank, Thank you. Does staff have a presentation as well? Yes. I won't uh, belabor it too much. Lacey did a pretty good job covering background and outline. I will uh, just highlight some of staff's responses and opinions about the uh, conditional use. Of course, conditional use for the ski locker in G2 has some use standards, one of them being that it is accessed from the interior. You can't have lockers facing out into the public space. They did meet that. Um, in terms of being compatible with other uses or plans, uh, certainly we don't find that it ski lockers are specifically addressed or even tangentially in any of our, our plans necessarily. The proposed use being consistent with the purpose of the zone district. Um, as you know, G2 is to make a mixed use district to provide resort oriented high intensity commercial uses complementary to that ski base area. Uh, having this infrastructure here for people to store and use skis, we found did obviously complement the, the ski industry and otherwise. We actually found as well that probably by having more locker facilities, it would help encourage our multimodal use of that area, which is important to us and consistent with the G2 zone district and allows people to store things and linger and spend more time there. We all know that when you're standing around in your ski boots, you drink a, a few less drinks or have a few less sandwiches maybe than when you're standing around in your shoes. So uh, in terms of negative impacts, we do not find that there are any negative or it would contribute to any undesirable offsite impacts. And it would, because this is all an interior retrofit of the space, there's no exterior, there's no site development, everything else does uh, tend to comply with all applicable requirements of the CDC. Um, staff does recommend approval for the conditional use of ski lockers, application PL20230092. Great, thank you very much. Yep. Questions from commissioners? Can you touch on parking again on this one? I, I see in your uh, report, the parking standard is not applicable. How does that work? Or do we just not care because again, it's not a net change or, or how are we addressing? Uh, hold on one second. Self-service. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I was correct before I said this out loud, which is a thing I should do more often. Uh, Self-service storage facility in G2. It is explicitly, it's not, a parking is not applicable. Mm -hmm. I believe with the understanding there's, you can see if you read between the lines or you read the lines in the code, um, there were a couple like the use standards are designed for ski locker storage. I think when they made the parking requirement, the understanding is that these users are already there. It's not drawing in more users to the space. 
so that parking would be accommodated by any other existing uses. Okay, thanks. And kind of along those lines, the, the conditional use designation that this has in G2 kind of surprised me a little bit, made me want to get to the bottom of that a little bit more. For example, why I wonder, did we not set it up as like a limited use or something like that, where it just had the extra use standard as opposed to specifically conditional? What is it that's conditional or worth taking a look at more than other re resort uses? I think you could have other, because it is lumped in with self-service or self-service storage facility indoor, it might not be ski lockers. You could potentially rent out, you know, eight by 10 little, that seems large, four by six little closets or otherwise that, you know, people are just generally using to store outdoor fitness stuff. So I think you could review that in a different capacity than ski lockers. Mm. I would also just add that as a conditional use, the, the purpose of that process is that you evaluate it on a site specific basis. So not every ski locker, uh, ski locker use even, or any other sort of indoor storage may not be appropriate at every location. So, you know, by approving this one at this location, it doesn't mean that another one at some other location you may find has different impacts, for example, to the pedestrian um, or the retail, you know, the adjoining retail spaces or something like that. You may not want it in your most prime location, mm. for example. That makes sense. And so as you reviewed this location, I saw that there was a kind of pedestrian directional kind of site plan. You took a look at that and found that this is this is actually a great location. Yeah, relatively, it doesn't sit on the peripheral of the arrival sequence uh, that you're really trying to activate. So it's tucked in, but yet still accessible. Certainly, we want ski lockers to be accessible. So, okay, thank you. Other questions? So, self storage is conditional for both industrial and this G2. Two weeks ago, it was not recommended. This week, it is recommended. What exactly is the difference? Because I'm a little confused now. If you're talking about this could be used to store outdoor things or it's small storage units. Two weeks ago, it was very similar, yet that was not recommended. Like why, why is there this difference? What makes this different? I think every application that we review is different. Um, the way that they're used and how they're used, I know don't uh, mean to shrug this off. That was an hour and 45 minute meeting. So to to bring all that back to light, um, I think they're two entirely different projects to be, to be short about it. And that's why we review, we review each of them. That's why conditional uses exist. If there's something maybe more specific that I could answer broadly, that's relevant to this one. Um, I, th I think I'm happy to do that. It just seems like a broad discussion. I'm not sure where you're trying to get. I guess, so industrial, we see a lot of self-storage mm -hmm. kind of ended up last week of like, we don't recommend this. There's a lot of self-storage. There are a bunch of other things on that. And Rebecca, kind of what you were saying in G2, if there's additional self-storage, we look at that on one-on-one. -on -one. I'm kind of having a hard time finding that inflection point at which it goes from recommended to not recommended and, and the why. But part of that, and now I'm rehashing an, an old proceeding, so I will be short to it was that we actually viewed that self storage not as self storage we viewed it as an accessory to the residential use so staff's opinion was that it actually wasn't functioning as the code intends for self storage to be it was functioning like residential and this is functioning as self storage is that helpful any other questions? I'll follow up on that a little bit. Once we approve self-storage, can any other kind of self-storage unit go in after that? Or is that's enough? Um, so I think I would, my opinion would be that this approval for this conditional use is for the ski lockers. Um, if another business, like if that business were to change hands, change names, 
but operate with similar characteristics, that would be within the conditional use approval. But if the characteristics or nature of the business changed drastically, significantly, um, then I would think it would come back through the conditional use process. And just, just to, I'm going to just repeat it again, just, even though they're still an indoor conditional use, you think it would have to be re-approved? I think that's, that's if strange. you're right, plant, so we've reviewed this on the premise that these are ski, lock, um, ski lockers. I recognize that they'll have summer, you know, non-ski season use for, you know, use of the base area, that kind of thing. Um, but that's really the premise that this is, um, based on that these are small lockers for personal sort of belongings, personal gear, clothing change, that kind of thing. Um, that's an accurate description of what we're looking at here. If that indoor area was to be renovated to, for example, like Jeremy said, include larger type storage units where you're going to see people carrying furniture in there or something. I mean, that's a different kind of a use that I would imagine planning commission might have a different analysis in terms of whether this is the appropriate location in our community. So yes, I would think if the, the nature of the use were to change significantly to not be in line with what's presented here tonight, that would come back through the conditional use process. Uh, I guess I'm still a little concerned, but a, a, a condition of approval be appropriate if, I, if I'm, because what I read the recommended motion is that we're approving a conditional use application to allow indoor self-storage facility. We're not approving, per se, a, a ski storage unit. And I, I would hope the applicant wouldn't have a problem with such a conditional use, but is, am I, is that overkill or do you, does it feel appropriate considering my, I mean, I know it's far out there that the chances of this becoming some weird storage thing that would sure. not be appropriate. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a reach. I think I understand the concern. I, I think what would have to happen from planning commission is you would have to uh, set those parameters that might, you know, saying ski storage, we, we know it's going to have year round use as well. So you'd have to come up with some sort of um, parameters to apply to what that means to you in terms of dimension and use and size and other things. Obviously, the yeah. I would if also you, say that the approval is for what's being presented. So the application is part of that approval. Um, you could, if you wanted to, if it made you more comfortable at a condition at the um, agreement of the applicant, you could add a condition to be explicit to, you know, the type of storage that's described in the application. But I do think that that is inherent in the approval. I, th I think it would almost end up being your condition would be less direction to the applicant it would be guidance to planning staff for when you know ownership or change of use which is i think what you're alluding to rich in the future any condition would really just be guidance towards staff of when it's going out of bounds of what you think was approved because we're approving what's being presented in terms of plan and use and function um so you would be providing guidance to us i think is sort of the perspective that I'm gaining as we talk this through. Okay. I guess all, all I'm looking for, mainly Rebecca, is a stronger assertion. I was listening very carefully to your words and you were like, I think it would go this way. You weren't you weren't saying, oh, it would definitely be, because in my mind I could make the argument, it's still self-storage. Mm -hmm. Why do I have to have come come in for a review? Um and I don't know. Doesn't it get into maybe this helps solidify this question, doesn't it get into kind of minor modifications of a development plan versus or conditional use versus what becomes a major modification. We have all these checks and balances within the code already. We So we wouldn't even necessarily, if there's no site development, it could just be a building permit. Of course, if there's a change of use, depending on how they qualify it with the building department, that would trigger off another thing. We would see it come across our desk probably through the building permit, and we would have to make a determination as staff as to whether or not we thought it was a change of use. Yeah, so, and I apologize for saying I think, because um, I try to be as direct as I can, but the reason why I say that is because with a conditional use, there is always going to be some amount of subjectivity. For example, in the past, we've approved, say, for example, a restaurant as a conditional use in a certain zone district, and that restaurant went out of business, a new restaurant came in, um, 
they might serve different food. They might have slightly different hours of operation, be a different type of restaurant, but generally as long as um, we don't feel that the impacts of that use have changed enough that it isn't within the prior approval. So like in that restaurant example for, you know, that had a very specific approval with a very specific operating plan. So it was a really clear way to determine whether that use had changed or not. Um, but a lot of other uses aren't going to have those very specific operating plans. So there's always going to be some judgment as to whether um, the use changed, whether the, it's an expansion of that use or a different, the characteristics are such that it is not in keeping with the prior approval. So there's always going to be, I think, some subjectivity in determination that staff has to make. Um, so I, I do believe that in this case, it's, the record will be pretty clear as to what the intent of planning, understanding of planning commission and intent of planning commission would be if you were to approve this use. But again, if you would want something to be more explicit than that in the record, you could, you know, ask if the applicant would be agreeable to some kind of a condition. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? No, hearing none. Uh, seeing no public. Uh, is there any public comment online? Somebody in a waiting room. Hearing none online either, unless there's any final follow up from the applicant. Thomas, do you have any follow up? <laughs> He's on the call for Chancy. We're... He may not be able to speak. Okay. Um, we can ask, is he on the, is he the telephone number? You think, I think so? Okay. I don't um, know, but... If we can. I think we're probably good. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We can, add, I mean, we can unmute if needed. Yeah. They just don't have the ability to do it themselves. We'll, we'll just check real quick. You can do it. I can't unmute them. Yeah. Just tell me if you could raise, did they do a hand raise? Okay, yeah. I think Hello, he is unmuted is now. Can you, guys, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yes. we can. Hey, sorry. Uh, somehow my call was dropped right in the middle of the discussion, so I actually have uh, no clue <laughs> where we're at at this point. At this point, we're just asking if uh, the applicant has any kind of final follow-up statement um, to close the application portion. And Thomas, we, um, we do not on our end, unless you have any okay. final comments. Um, and, and this is a recommend, has this been recommended for approval at this point? No, not at this I, point. I don't, unless there's any questions. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer, but I don't uh, have anything to add. All right, perfect, thanks. Anything else from you, Jeremy? No. No other questions? I'll close our public portion, come to commissioners for discussion and a motion. I think that ski locker and, you know, gear storage at the base is highly valued by the community. Um, when they shut down the ones below Christie Sports, it was uh, people were up in arms and seems like a good use of the space. Great. I agree. Um, and I also think that um, market economics will probably take care of any weird so other self storage uses that might arise. I don't think they're going to get the same kind of premium as ski lockers are going to get. I'm on board with this as well. I just would like to put out there personally, I would love some kind of a self storage crash course for us or like a further conversation. Cause I feel like this is a recurring topic that keeps coming up. I feel like the waters have gotten a bit muddy, but I'm on board for this use in this circumstance. Anybody want to make a motion? I'll move to approve PL 2023-0092. Second. Motion a second. Any other discussion? I mean, I feel what AJ said, there's really not going to, my, my scenario really isn't going to happen, but sometimes I get to be a policy wonk. I'm sorry. Um, but I, and, I, and honestly, my concerns are actually more of a personal nature. The loss of the general store in that area, I think was, was pretty good. And and because we the ski the ski the ski base area is kind of in transition, we're still missing ski time square, and we, we should be thinking about the law to some degree, the loss of, of 
commercial space in that area. Now we talk about it in just about every one of these variances, but you know, in almost every zone district. And we don't, but we don't have any quantifiable information to say, you know, do we need to be generating more sales tax in this space or not? I guess it's really what comes down to it being required to, to be commercial. Uh, it's nothing, I don't think it affects this particular application, but again, I'm just beating the dead horse that this is something we talk about all the time and we have no quantitative way to decide if the loss of, in this case, the loss of ground floor commercial space is of importance or not. But otherwise, it's obviously a need that, that, that has to be covered. I agree with you. And, and I think Steph answered my question really well about the nature of the conditional use to begin with. If you think about it, you know, take it to a ludicrous standpoint. If all the commercial spaces were ski storage only and there were no restaurants or anything, we'd have a problem. It, it, it should not be used by right. It should be considered case by case basis. This one, I think, works just fine. There's there's not a an abundance of this use at this point. So, and, and I was also really encouraged by the the thought of potentially more multi multimodal transportation with less people needing to drag their skis to and from. Um, I think is kind of a great. Um, Advantage, benefit? Any other discussion? Hearing none? Uh, oh, go ahead, please. No, no. Oh, okay. I didn't want to step on your toes. I'll call for a vote. Yes. Yes. Aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Good luck. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, thanks. Oh, there he is. Rebecca, do we have a director's report this evening? Um, I do. I have a few things that I'll share that may be of interest to you. Um, wanted to give you sort of an update on where we are with short-term rental licensing. As of Monday of this week, we have received 2,400 license applications. We have reviewed 1,038 of those, approved 807, and only 41 of them came in after the April 30th deadline. So I think we're looking um, pretty good there um, and making good progress on working through those approvals. Um, once we get to probably around 90% approved, we will um, go live with the complaint hotline. So I think once we have them, you know, almost all of the contact information and license information into Granicus, we can um, launch the hotline. Um, also wanted to just note, it is noxious weed season. So our code enforcement officer is very busy um, out in the community doing inspections to identify noxious weeds on private property and then working with those property owners to um, mitigate the weeds and take care of them um, so that we don't have to take any enforcement action. Um, we have been um, working um, on Brown Ranch in a couple of different capacities. Um, as you probably know, the annexation committee continues to meet every other week to review a draft annexation agreement. Um, I've also talked briefly with Jason Peasley, the executive director of the Housing Authority, um, and he has indicated they, they are gonna start preparing to submit the planning application for annexation um, it, pretty soon. Um, so that will come before planning commission. That is gonna be your opportunity to weigh in on the annexation um, and make a recommendation to city council. Um, we also, Brad and I had a meeting with our code consultants today, and we have received just this week an outline of some um, code amendments that they've worked on for the TND zone districts. So we're doing a staff review over the next uh, week or so, providing some feedback to them, um, and they will start drafting those amendments, and that will also come before planning commission um, for your review and uh, input and recommendation. Um, we're hoping to have sort of a draft, um, probably in the July, June, July timeframe. So just wanted to get that on your radar. You're going to see that um, in the near future. And then lastly, just wanted to let you know, right now we have 312 projects that are currently in the development review process. Um, so 
That number has been consistently around 300 for um, the last couple of years. And I just note that because um, we thought that that was a spike a couple of years ago and it really has not um, declined at all. We continue to have a heavy, heavy development review workload. So um, happy to answer any questions if you have any. Are there any questions? What percentage of the STRs does that represent? My recollection is we were talking about what, 2,800, 2,900 that we thought existed? Yeah. Um, I mean, we, I have always thought we maybe have around 3,000. Right. Um, so we're at 2,400 applications. Um, so we may still see more come in. There may be, if, you know, there we may see some of those numbers decline a little bit. Some people just may choose not to. We may not see another spike in application activity until maybe um, later in the year as people gear up for the next ski season. So some people don't list it all year long. Um, so, you know, we may see another spike later in the year if some additional applications come in. But since April 30th, so it's almost been um, a month, um, we've only seen 41 applications come in. So the bulk of those came in prior to that deadline. So, I mean, is it possible then that it represents a 10, 15% reduction in short-term rental opportunities? I I'm, would hesitate to say that because again, I don't know that 3000 estimate that I've always sort of operated, you know, that I've kind of used as we've gone through those numbers, the numbers literally fluctuate daily. So it's hard to know. Um, I mean, that was really a best guess and it's just, it's hard to know. Um, the, the, the number that we're seeing right now, and I actually, um, while we're talking, I can probably pull up Granicus and actually tell you what Granicus is saying um, is actively advertising. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get my Zoom window away from my bookmark. Okay. Um, I can tell you what we think is actively advertising right now. And we'll see what that looks like. So right now they show 2,800 STR units. So um, we have about 2,400 license applications in the door. Um, there could be another 400 out there that are currently active advertising that don't have their license applications in. So, I mean, does that mean they're not going to get their license or? They're going to operate illegally. Or... <laughs> what do you mean? Um, it may mean that they're operating illegally, and that's as we start to get these licensed, we will um, our tools for identifying illegally operating STRs will be more accurate, and so we will be able to identify who's operating legally and who's not. And if we find, you know, for those that we find that are not, then yes, there would be enforcement action taken, they may be subject to a two-year ban and not be able to receive a license. So I assume Granicus would then compare the applications we have and then what's being advertised. Yep, we will be um, exporting our license database to Granicus um, on a frequent basis to begin with. And then, you know, we'll kind of see what kind of cadence we need to export so that they can um, identify, match those with the units that are being advertised and um, go from there. I should note some of these that show up as STRs are actually only being rented on a long-term basis. So um, Granicus does their best to sort of weed those out, but sometimes 
you know, as we further investigate what's actually occurring there is a 30 day or more rental. And so, so, you know, I give you these numbers knowing that they will become much more accurate once we export the license database to Granicus. So somewhere down the short-term road. <laughs> where, I think we'll, we'll be in a position where we need to answer that question very accurately. Because I think that's going to become a, an issue in this town. The question of, was there a reduction? Yeah, and I'm not sure that we'll ever actually be able to answer that accurately because we um, will never know what the what the true number really was at, and and that what what date are we going to right? And because that number did fluctuate over throughout the year, you have to sort of make some assumptions. I understand, but yep. I think that question won't come. Mm -hmm. I'll follow up on that. I think I heard you say that there's a. It sounded like a significant number of applications did not receive a license. Is there a particular reason? Is it just administrative that you know they didn't fill the form out properly, or is there some other glaring issue with those applications that? Yeah, so a I think you're asking about when I so the number that were have been reviewed is 1,038, and the number approved is 807. So that difference of just over two about 230 applications are likely pending additional information. So yes, a lot of the first, the uh, some of the like first applications that came in the door were grossly incomplete. I think a lot of people were just like, I need to just fill this out and pay a fee and, and feel good um, and didn't attach any of the required documentation information or they filled it out incorrectly. And so we've been working to get that, that Corrected. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Our director? Thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, we'll move on to uh, we have one public hearing minute uh, to approve. This is April 27th. Looks like we're missing Lou, Brian, and Derek on that one. Move to approve. Second. Motion and uh, a different second. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I was there. No, that's what he was just calling out. Oh. That was a, I think that was, yeah. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. Great. And that passes. I believe that's it for us this evening. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. We're adjourned at 608. Thank you.